Hi, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, pleasure being with all of you. Uh, I'll, I'll start with a special thanks to the Geisha uh, Geisha team for giving me opportunity to be at uh, this great event which is happening, and also giving me opportunity to be with two eminent uh, people, leaders from the education sector, uh, uh, Dr. Sanjay Chaudhary and uh, Dr. Jack Mohan. Uh, pleasure being you with you. Uh, Dr. Sanjay Chaudhary is the Dean of Students and the Dean of School of uh, Engineering and Applied Science, Ahmedabad University. And Dr. Jagmohan Bhanbar is the Dean of, uh, sorry, he's the CEO of uh, Next Milestone Technologies, Private Limited. And he's also the executive coach, uh, writer, was the Dean Emeritus IFFM, and he's an ex banker. So um, great to be with you. Uh, before we start, I think uh, let me kind of and let me kind of and talk about with what uh, our secretaries, secretary IT is just kind of and hinted us or other kind of and messages he gave us. Right? It's a it's a very kind of and positive day today, especially for the Gujarat. Our state has been recognized as the top state in the overall startup ecosystem development, which is a great news. And the kind of and growth also that we are seeing, especially in the many manufacturing sector in Gujarat, which is, uh, that's actually tremendous. So, um, lovely start of the day today, uh, with so much positive news coming in. And plus the, um, again, the great part is the, whatever we are talking since morning is again, full of learnings. And this session in which we will further take the learning to the next level by talking on the future of the learning. And that's where the whole focus of this session will be. So welcome, Dr. Sanjay, and welcome, Jack Mohanji. Uh, so before we start, let me let me kind of and define what I think. Uh, what is the future of learning, or how how do we look at it? Right? And when we are talking in the new normal, the future, from my perspective, I think will become when human and machines are working together. Right? That's the future which is coming out for everyone. And this is this this is a something which will be a unique way for all of us, and which will lead to a lot of changes within us in terms of how do we work. Right. So the workplace will get redefined in every enterprise right now, and I, I think it has already started happening since the COVID has happened. The the whole way of work has changed. We have all talking of remote in every aspect of it. Right. So what this will lead to is a lot of unlearning and relearning on how to learn. Right? So uh, that will be the massive change which is uh, going to happen. The learning will need to have a lot of flexibility, adaptability, and empathy. So these are the three things which I kind of can feel that uh, this will kind of create the major disruptions uh, in the learning. We are talking about a lot of platforms coming in, and I think we will talk in detail about uh, what are those, but uh, but I think the major transformation has started happening. So let me start with the, uh, with the Professor Sanjay. Like, uh, what are the innovations are we seeing in the learning? And I think maybe that's the question which we can, uh, all of us answers or, or uh, we can start with. What do you think the kind of an innovations we are seeing in the overall learning environment right now, um, what challenges are seeing, what challenges are happening, and uh, and how these innovations are helping. So good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you, Amit. Uh, thank you, Jagmohan. And you know, Gesia team for inviting us on a, such a very interesting topic. Professor Jain has given a very interesting, uh, uh, very interesting, you know, background and how academics and university can do wonderful uh, activities for the society. Uh, I mean, I will take a little liberty and I will first start with the challenges because uh, when lockdown was announced and suddenly we, we all came in a corner in a sense, you know, uh, from next day or next week, universities were supposed to be offline, you know, teach students online. And then we decided that, yeah, we will take this challenge and we will start. So like any uh, you know, digital savvy, technology savvy university organization, you know, we are using digital technology or ICT technologies extensively on day-to-day -day operations, campus operations, and many activities, including research collaborations and, and some aspects of uh, you know, academic pedagogy. And we will touch on that a little later on also. 
So this uh, situation really uh, imposed various challenges in front of us. And I will go a little deeper in a sense. Uh, and, and because of that, perhaps uh, participants would get good idea about it. A, any university is likely to have multiple schools, not only one school which is very technology oriented. Uh, you know, we are, a, we, are a, we are like university, uh, which is very broad and based on liberal education, uh, research led kind of delivery. So we have primarily three schools, School of Art Science, uh, then there is a school for management, and then there is a school of engineering and applied science. Plus there are few research centers. Now we can understand, you know, uh, faculty members in these schools, they are different, their styles are different, uh, their academic delivery is different, expectations of students are different. Some faculty in some school, they prefer different model of teaching. Uh, faculty in management, they prefer case-based kind of teaching. Uh, faculty in engineering, they prefer different kind of model to deliver. Within engineering also, you know, we are not only ICT. Uh, we have, you know, computer science and engineering, plus we have chemical engineering and mechanical engineering. Now, you know, when there are labs and, and in engineering, as we know that, that you know, the combination of both uh, theory plus hands-on has to be very solid. Now, suddenly students are not able to come to the labs. Now, how to deal, deal with that situation? Now, last semester, very, uh, I mean, you know, very frankly, I will tell you that during winter semester, uh, we could not do much for the labs uh, because labs were, were closed. Uh, we could not do much and that created a very interesting challenge. This semester also we are online and, and as there are challenges, we are thinking a little differently and I will, I will address those issues when we enter into innovations and, and, and new, new pedagogy models. Another interesting challenge was regarding faculty know-how. Uh, we claim that faculty members are competent and they can switch to this kind of you know, uh, teaching, kind of online teaching very easily. I'm sure Jagmohan and you both will agree with me that it is not that easy at all. You know, faculty members have to be performers, you know, their style of uh, conducting online sessions and the way things are happening over MOOCs and other things that are utterly different compared to when you teach uh, in the class. In the class, you know, you can apply some traditional models which you cannot apply here. So that was another challenge uh, for us. I already talked about, you know, engineering aspects and science related aspects where students used to go I mean, they go to the labs and, you know, half of the time they are in the lab and now that part is cut off and, 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 and we could not do much. And the last challenge which we observed and which we are still not able to address very effectively is that our students, you know, they are scattered all over India, not only urban areas, but they are in, 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 in rural areas. And believe me, they, some of the students, they live in so much of interior uh, uh, rural areas of India where internet connectivity is a dream. And we keep on teaching online and we assume that students are available for six to eight hours online. I think that really opened up our eyes. So these were in nutshell, you know, the challenges which we observed. And in the next round, when we talk about, you know, how we addressed and what are the innovation, maybe I will go further into that. Sure. Um, Professor Jagpohan. Thanks, Amit. Uh, and Thanks. Uh, before I start, I'd just like to thank uh, Gesia, the organizers, uh, yourself and Sanjay for being here and for inviting me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm really looking forward to this discussion. Uh, Sanjay has already nailed it quite on the head. So a lot of stuff that he's spoken about. Uh, so I'm not going to repeat that, but I'd like to maybe capture a few other aspects on the challenges part. Uh, let's start with GERs, gross enrollment ratios. Uh, if you look at it, while there's been a lot of progress in increasing the gross enrollment ratios in India, uh, our last analyzed gross enrollment ratio in India was about, uh, I think about 26%, right? Compare this to some of the other markets. In the, the US, it would be about 88, 90%. Uh, in Germany, it's about 70%. In UK, it is about uh, 60, Canada, 69. So there is a distance to go. And when you look at the number of uh, potential learners uh, in our country, uh, that gross enrollment ratio uh, speaks volumes. So that's the first challenge. How do you increase the gross enrollment ratio? Now, obviously, there is a limitation uh, to how many more classrooms you can set up. There's a limitation to how many universities or campuses you can set up. Uh, and I'm not going to get into solutions right now because I'm expecting that somewhere down the line, you will ask us for for innovations that support it. Yeah, yeah. But GER is one of the big issues. The second is the quantum of 
trained faculties. Now, quantum of trained faculties, even in the traditional segment, needs to be augmented, and we've all been talking about it. Uh, but in the new paradigm, where online learning is going to take away a significant chunk of traditional learning, as Sanjay mentioned a while ago, it requires a sea change. You cannot just juxtapose a traditional faculty and place them in a virtual classroom and expect that everything is going to happen the same way or better. So mindset change for the faculty, that's going to be a challenge. Surmountable challenge, but it is a challenge. The other thing is the pedagogy. How do you adapt to the virtual paradigm as a faculty, as an instructor? That will need to undergo a change. And then, of course, there is technology. The, the comfort with using technology, uh, you know, especially if you've not been uh, 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 using it too much in the past. Uh, and uh, then there are issues like bandwidth. So we're not just talking about metro cities. If you want to democratize this, take it to smaller towns, smaller cities, is the technology architecture going to be able to support this? That becomes the other challenge. Uh, what else? The, I think one of the other large potential challenges is when you think of India's demographic dividend. Now, most of us understand demographic dividend, but for those who, who may not be uh, as clear, uh, in very simple words, it's uh, the, the number of, or the percentage of working population in the overall uh, number of people who are out there. Uh, India has a great potential dividend, which means we have a lot of people who are in the working population age. And compared to all of the markets, including China, we are very well placed. But then um, this is half of the story. If you look at the other half, you're looking at a situation where our employability level in the, in the nation is particularly low. And I'm not talking about employment. I'm talking about employability. So our overall employability, even in the last statistic, though it's gone up, um, uh, is at approximately about 50%, which means 50% of our workforce is still unemployable. That means they do not have the skills and the knowledge that the industry requires. If you look at engineering, and Sanjay can probably bear me out on that, uh, close to 90% of the engineers across various reports have been stated to be unemployable. Now, that is another challenge. And I think virtual, along with a lot of other changes, might be able to address the challenge, but we'll keep that for later. So I think these are two challenges that I would certainly want to talk about, GER, demographic dividend. The third is the pattern in which learning has happened historically in our country. I think there are some fantastic things about how education happens in India. But like most of the things, there are also things which have a flip side. So for instance, the world today is moving more towards personalization. Whereas where we are still probably hovering around is more of a one size fit all approach. So I think that's the other challenge that we will need to address. How do we personalize learning? Now, you could use technology to do it. You could use 20 other things. But that is indeed a challenge, right? And the fourth, of course, is the degree of learner engagement. So if your learners are not engaged, they're not going to complete courses. Dropout rates are going to be higher, whether it's in the traditional courses or it's in MOOCs. And that's what's happening. Uh, if the learners are not engaged, they will not learn sufficiently, which means tomorrow their contribution in the enterprise sector is also going to be low. So these are some of the challenges. I, I think I'd like to kind of take a pause here and maybe talk more as we go forward. Yeah, yeah, sure, thanks. So thanks for bringing up this, um, this is very pertinent points. And I think you talked about very, very kind of critical aspects of like the personalization technology, uh, the solutions that we need. But before we get into it, I think the, the biggest point, I, I, I think for me, which you highlighted was on the employability, right? So the employability right now is, I mean, said talked about it's less than, 50%. And, and there is other aspect of it is that uh, the, the future jobs are changing while the our current workforce is kind of not fully enabled with the, for, for the current jobs. But that even the job roles are changing, which means, I mean, if we kind of don't act now, then in that case, the this problem of 50% will be even become more right? so with, with the rail with the rate of change of the jobs. So 
so then the skills becomes the kind of and becomes the more important and and i think you should be talking also about the skills of the future while the we really are talking about future of learning but to, to kind of and why would why do we need it is because we need to impart the uh, skills of the future they are so interconnected amit they are so yeah very connected so let's talk about the what are the skills that we are that we need so that we are able to provide to our people our workforce better skills uh, so that their employability increase and then we are able to better perform in the future so what kind of and skills will be needed in the future which everyone should look forward to so uh, look it requires a mindset change right yeah uh if you look at the paradigm in which we were brought up and i'm talking about our generation right um so people in their late 40s early 50s um we were not conditioned to learn how to learn at least i was conditioned to memorize i was conditioned to believe that academic grades are great and as long as you have brilliant academic grades your future is set but i think what needs to change one of the things that needs to change is we need to as a country and it's not just faculties as parents as well we need to evolve the mindset which is look help students or help learners learn to learn right which means less of memorization more of problem solving orientation okay um uh so i have learned these skills but how do i use these skills to solve real life problems out there that is going to be a very critical skill uh, for the future um social skills um my my organization has been working with uh, uh, students and with corporate learners over the last 20 years and one of the challenges we face uh, when organizations say that person a or b is not employable is not because they don't have the necessary technical knowledge it's the lack of social ability interpersonal skills social skills i think that's something which is going to be a very powerful uh, fuel for the future a uh, creativity right uh, the willingness to question the paradigm and and say okay how could this be different because when you do that disruption happens right uh, so there's a lot of stuff but i think uh, sanjay would be yeah. the ideal person to respond to this question yes you know, I, i agree i agree with you jack on completely and uh, you know you 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 straight away pointed out very clearly and in academics uh, from academics point of view i should say we should confess it our pedagogical models are poor uh, we don't encourage i'm when i say we means in general uh, across the globe or our country uh, we we don't encourage learning part and not learning self learning also and if these students they have to survive in industry at least for next 40 to 50 years because you know your career is at least for 40 to 50 years plus you get significant turns in your career also so you should be ready to adapt you know the new new challenges nobody thought about this pandemic you know before few years maybe last december when we all were celebrating and look at the kind of challenge it has posed coming back uh, to university point of view i think we have to think and we have to work extensively very creatively on pedagogy so what we are doing in that particular sense is you know we we, we believe that you know we need to adapt uh, different pedagogy one of them is a project based learning now when you say project based learning you know most faculty they think that you know doing a small project in a course is a project based learning that is not the case it's a different philosophy different pedagogical model you think course as a project so when you talk to industry people they talk about big project construction of a dam is a project and think about the complexity involved in that kind of problem so when you think a course as a project as a faculty your delivery model changes straight away here i can give you a very simple example so that you know things become little simple you cannot tell young students to construct a dam or think about you know what could be the design to construct a dam but let's say uh, we are teaching them an engineering course on electronics so instead of teaching electronics in a flat manner can we start with a project like you know some insect which can fly take that as a project and as a part of this four or six months course at the end of semester you have to ensure that that insect is going to fly so think about materials think about electronic components think about material science think about physics things that think about mathematics and get those components construct them and you have faculty 
faculty will be teaching concepts not in a flat manner you know faculty will be teaching only required aspects so as a student you go and ask faculty that i want to do this what can i do how can i do so the whole teaching paradigm changes drastically now here of course faculty's role is to facilitate everything but faculty has to be more knowledgeable previously you know i used to go and deliver the way i wanted now the youngsters are going to challenge me that your theory the way you have told me is not working here so as jagmohan you said that why they are unemployed because you know they have learned in a very flat manner they have only you know most probably they did nothing else but mugging up those concept and you know they they cleared exams with grades here of course what you are doing is you know you are telling them very clearly now another thing is when they do this kind of uh, projects you know when i say project based learning there is no point in no point in teaching seven eight courses in a semester why not to teach based four courses in a semester and not only teaching these courses but please ensure that you know we teach uh, we do projects across the courses instead of you know dumping 10 projects in a semester give them only two three projects another example which i can think from my domain point of view and equally somebody from mechanical engineering can think differently is that say you know when you are teaching linear algebra signal and system and computer organization if you make them independent isolated you know completely isolated students are not going to make out of it but if three faculty members can come together and define a project which is based on linear algebra computer organization plus signal and systems and then do a project i think students are going to enjoy heavily and coming back to your issue at that can they be employed can their skills improve can they be more competent i according to me the answer is yes and slowly and gradually we are able to realize that that kind of pedagogy is giving us uh, you know very good uh, results just before i conclude you know uh, it is not that we are the innovative uh, players in this domain we have learned all these concepts by our interactions with the best engineering colleges of the world and one of them is olin college of engineering which is the pioneer in uh, in, in usa uh, massachusetts area and it comes in uh, undergraduate uh, top 3 uh, colleges we all think that mit is great but believe me people from mit faculty from mit they have left and they have joined olin college of engineering because they that is considered as in top 3 undergraduate engineering colleges another model is a harvey mudd college of engineering they their pedagogy is different uh, so both you know amit and jagmohan my 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 argument is that we have to think drastically we have to be creative we have to spend a lot of time on pedagogy we have to empower our faculty and as as a university it should be our commit commitment yeah. plus for project based learning commitment must come from the top it cannot be from individual because it is very resource intensive one course instead of being taught by one faculty you might have three faculty as i told you that you know flying insect will require uh, uh, even faculty from physics to come into, in, into the class at times so we have to change everything universities i think if you ask me very frankly i have spent almost my whole life in university i think we guys have to change so much looking at the requirement the way they are coming in front of us so these are the my arguments you know and maybe we will extend yeah. a little bit later great sure. sure. thanks so i think yeah man so while you talked about uh, uh, pedagogy and also the project based uh, learnings i think one of the other important element that that comes up is the industry academy engagement i think doc, dr jain also talked in detail about I mean, how critical it is uh, to have a deeper engagement between the industry and academia and especially industry right now looking at redefining the workforce we talked about skills i mean giving employees the all the best of the skills and plus the uh, many of the research engagements will require a lot of close collaboration between the faculty i mean and plus the industry leaders right so what are the kind of and things you are seeing in the industry uh, academy engagement is something um, It's kind of an happening. What the way it should happen? We can do something more beyond it. I mean, what 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 could be the way to make it real success? I think that's a very powerful question, Ahmed. That's a very powerful question. And uh, <clears throat> so uh, let me let me start by saying, if you're building a if you're building a car, you don't build a car out of your head. You get your team to spend a lot of time with people who are going to be using the car. right uh if you're building a toy for uh for kids you're going to engage with kids and figure out what is it that they are looking for in that toy 
what we are building in education institutions today is not too different. It is a product which is going to be consumed by the industry. And if it is going to be consumed by the industry, it's only fair and logical that, uh, 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 you know, as education institutions, we need to be able to immerse ourselves and our students more in the world of the industry. And not just that, get the industry to come to us and engage with us. So, you know, it's, it's like they say, um, you need to not just bring the working world. How, how do you make that happen? Industry to come to academia? How, how do we do um, uh, Like uh, uh, 10, 15 years ago, I observed that, you know, uh, institutions would have an industry coordinator whose job it would be to try and get as many speakers as you could to the institute and, you know, get them to talk. It was a great idea. But today, you don't need that. Today, you have technology at your hand. You can actually have 200 industry professionals coming and engaging with your students, whether it's a, a, a K-12 or a, a college, a professional college or otherwise, right? So the tech, enable, tech enablement is there to do it. But the more important question is, why should an industry person actually take out time to engage with the students? So I think that is where we need to be able to articulate a powerful narrative for the industry in terms of how this could actually help them, right? Because these are products that they're gonna to consume tomorrow. Secondly, um, merely a speaker coming in from an industry does not benefit either the institution or the student. You need continuous engagement with the industry to benefit all the stakeholders. So to take uh, you know, Sanjay's point ahead, uh, now one of the things that we are doing in our edtech business, for instance, is uh, if we are running a course on, let us say, uh, data science, uh, we may have the best faculties to run the program. But at the end of the day, if we can have mentors from the industry coming in and talking to our students and showing them how this knowledge of data science can actually help them in their career, not just for the course, but in the career, that becomes a very powerful narrative. And why is it important for the industry partner? Because they could actually use this as a potential talent pipeline that they could look at hiring, either as an intern or as an eventual resource. So it has to be a win-win. The industry needs to be able to recognize that they're getting great talent coming in. And this industry academy and Nexus is giving them an open doorway to that talent without going through the entire talent acquisition process. And for institutes and learners, there has to be a continuous value evolving from there. It cannot just be one particular instance where that happens. So I think these are a couple of things which, which uh, are worthy of consideration. Uh, and of course, as I said, there is enough technology to enable this um, uh, and make it more compelling. Uh, but I'm guessing Sanjay would have uh, more points out there. No, yeah, yeah. Yes. You, you, you said very, very clearly. So I will add a few points from our, 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 our experience point of view. Uh, of course, you know, most universities, what they're doing is, you know, they make uh, internships mandatory. So they bring in internships uh, mandatory as a part of curriculum. But then you have to ensure that, you know, that internship becomes very live, dynamic. Not only throw your students to the industry, how much involvement of your own faculty members is also involved. Look at the way Professor Jain said, you know, he's going to establish research park and he's going to bring in, you know, innovative uh, industry. That could be one option. Not only, I mean, that not, it is not that that is the only option because space will be limited. But when your students are going to industry, are your faculty members also involved with them? And I will give you an example here. You know, what we have done, uh, uh, we have a course on process simulation, which is a chemical engineering course. What we have done is our two faculty members, they are teaching it. There is a faculty from BITS uh, campus, uh, Dubai, Gulf, is also a co-teacher. And there is another faculty from one local college here is also helping as a teaching assistant. Now, what our faculty members did, Dharamshi Dharam and uh, Sridhar, what they did, these young faculty, they were talking to chemical engineering industry uh, for a while. And they, they collected problems from them. And uh, before establishing relationship, you know, we invited them. They invited them, they came. Now they are delivering talks even within the course. And as you said, Jagmohan, you know, this digital technology has made life very easy. You know, you can work in your office for a half an hour, you go and talk to students and come back to your office. 
So you don't have to spend one day just to compute and deliver the talk. So technology is enabling it. So we collected those problems, uh, industry problems of big industries, because you know chemical engineering is more applicable to big plants and so on. So they collected those problems and now they are giving these problems to the students. And of course they cannot work with the plants or real machines, but they can use simulation and modeling, use simulation and modeling very, very extensively, plus use some kind of, you know, remote connectivity and they use uh, some sophisticated software like, you know, S Pen and so on, which are widely used in chemical engineering and so on. So my suggestion is, you know, look at your own domain, identify these kind of courses, build your relationship. And as you know, re building relationship is very, very tough. It is not that industry will support you overnight or it is not that if industry comes at the last moment, then you know university will also be ready. I think it requires a significant planning. And according to me, uh, people at the top, you know, vice chancellor, deans, and program chairs, you know, they have to think about program structure, and then they have to see that you know all those things they go down, and that vision between top down or bottom up kind of you know vision both should gel, and we have to try continuously. And and I I still agree that uh, uh, you know it is not that we are able to win. We are able to build that very strong relationship with industry. Uh, we are a young university. We are still evolving. We have learned some lessons. And what we have done is, you know, we have we have strengthened our career development cell, career development center rather. And 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 one interesting thing I will I will tell you, Jagmohan uh, and Amit both, that you know, in career development cell, we have said these are the people who come from industry background. They are not necessarily from academic background. They have worked in industry for a long time. Not only they have worked in industry, but once a while they will conduct few capsule, you know, 10 minute kind of a topic. It's not an academic course, it's a capsule course. And when they talk to the students, they also realize that, you know, where students lack and instead of asking them to simply fill in the form, it is better that you have some kind of, you know, interface and so on. So make your career development cell very dynamic uh, from beginning and try to bring in more industry kind of, you know, relationship. And when industry people come, career development cell invites faculty from different disciplines so that they interact with them and then they discuss. On a couple of occasions, I have discuss with the people coming from very leading uh, organizations like Reliance and so on. And when they discussed with us, we realized that what kind of challenges they're facing in their day-to-day -day life. It could be data science or you know some problem in chemical engineering and so on. So these are the inputs which uh, we keep on getting and we have to build uh, around that particular part. But we need ecosystem, very sound ecosystem. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think, uh, 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 Professor Jan, again, I mean, since it is stressed about, I mean, I can also say that because he, he talked about the research park within IIT Kanunaga, and and we are actually part of the research park, and and we can see the benefits that uh, that we have seen over the last kind of an a year and a half, working with working close very closely with the IIT. I mean, the, the kind of an interactions, day to day interactions we have with the faculty members of the IIT is always brings in a lot of kind of a new learnings and the new ideas what can be taken it to the industry and maybe to the startups. So, so there is there's a lot of learning that kind of can happens from there, which is actually- Amit, I have, a, I, have a, uh, I have a small additional point here, if I may. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, there are three kinds of opportunities available to the industry today. One, at the lower end of the spectrum is a student coming out of a college university, could be any college, uh, with no additional credentials, apart from what they've learned in college. Uh, but remember, uh, uh, industry is not hiring you for your learning. Industry is hiring you for the skill that you bring to the table for them. And not any generic skill, but the skill they believe is going to add value to them. Okay. So this is at one end of the spectrum. A guy walks out of college with a degree, and that's the option. Option two is now, and uh, you know, uh, Dr. Sudhir was talking about, uh, uh, Dr. Jain was talking about uh, MOOCs, for instance. Now, MOOCs took this to another level. MOOCs said, okay, let's democratize learning. So you could be anywhere, anytime, any device, and you could go through our courses. That was a brilliant idea. Uh, having said that, if you look at the adoption of MOOCs and completion rates of MOOCs, most uh, courses uh, vary at about 20% uh, completion, right? A course era might be slightly higher. But most of the other MOOCs are low. Uh, lack of engagement right? Uh, a lack of motivation to complete the course. And why is the lack of motivation there? Because you don't see anything changing in your career graph after having earned that credential, right? Uh, as an industry man, between the option of hiring a student right from college or somebody from college, but with credentials from a MOOC, I'll hire the latter. 
if those credentials make sense to me. But there is a third option. The third option is where a student in a college has done his or her degree in whatever subject, but has picked up maybe one or two areas which they realize are hugely in demand as future skills, right? Let's say um, data analytics, just to take an example. And they have gone through an actual course on data analytics, not a MOOC course, but an actual course. There are six or seven projects as part of this, which are being done in partnership with various industry partners. So those guys are also adding their contributions there. They might also be reviewing those projects. And at the end of the project, there is, or rather at the end of the course, there is a capstone project, which is built with deep engagement with some industry partner. So you're not just doing it, you're presenting it also to the industry partner. The industry partner gets to see what you've done, your capability, and the actual application of your learning. Between the three people that I spoke about, the industry is going to pick up this resource. And this is where the ecosystem comes in. You need to be able to get those deep engagements with industry partners. You need to have that system in place where you know students can actually do this. Academicians are supporting it. Uh, and somebody needs to be able to mentor the students that, look, these are the eight or 10 skills which are going to be really uh, critical going forward. So I think that's the additional piece over there. Sure, sure. So I think, I mean, uh, Dr. Zagmo, let's, I mean, since you are talking about building an ecosystem and for ecosystem, I think the biggest enabler of that becomes the right now, at least is the online platforms. Right? So, or, or rather the whole platforms. We were always kind of and talking about the learning management system, content management systems, correct? Those are kind of and have always been there. But the learning is itself is transforming. Right? It used to be a guided learning to and now becoming an autonomous learning. Right? So I mean, that's the kind of and shift which is happening with the with the way the people kind of and is going to learn. Instead of time bound, it is becoming like a self-based learning. And again, Dr. Chen gave us an example of a student not attending the classes, but listening to the uh, videos and then learning in the evening and then uh, was the topper in the semester exam. So the, so the learning process has kind of been transforming. And then I think the platforms will become big enabler to make that happen, to make that happen in a best way for students, whether it is for employees or I mean, whether it is for anyone, right? So, and you, you have now kind of a great expertise on the platform. So can we talk about the platform on what is the changes you are seeing in the platform and then, and then how industry can adopt those platforms? Sure. Just a writer here. I don't think I have great expertise in that. I don't think anybody around the world has great expertise in it today because it's such a dynamic and evolving area, but I'll try and do my best to address that question. The LMS came up around the world almost 40 years ago. The first version of the learning management system came 40 years ago. It was built to um, partially automate the training process in organizations and in education enterprises. Over the last four years, the traditional LMS has taken a nosedive, two major reasons. Engagement levels on a traditional LMS are exceedingly low. It does not support personalized learning. There is no gamification. Uh, uh, fourth, you're not using disruptive technology, not for the sake of the technology, but to augment learning, right? Um, so these are some of the challenges that have been faced. Traditional LMSs have been very admin focused, administrator focused, not learner focused. Learning preferences have changed, Amit. Over the last few years, learner preferences have changed. Learners want to be in control of the learning process, which means if I go into a system, it's like what happens on Amazon. You go and pick up a book on mythology, within two hours, you will have 20 books being recommended. They have analyzed your user preferences. Today, a learner expects that he shouldn't be needing to go out there to curate content for himself or herself. Technology should be able to do it for them. So recommendation engines <clears throat> within learning systems have become very important. Uh, we've seen this happening with 
uh, players like Degreed and Edcast around the world. In fact, uh, our own company uh, 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 has been amongst the first uh, in this part of the world to do that, uh, which means you're giving the learner the control to figure out what content he or she should consume, right? But even today, uh, there's a lot that can be done. Look, if you ask a fish to climb a tree, two things will happen. The fish is not going to be able to do it, and you're going to end up calling the fish stupid. But the fish isn't stupid. It's just not meant to climb a tree, right? If you treat a bunch of 20 people the same way, and you have a one-size-fit-all approach from a learning perspective, some of these guys are going to be termed as stupid. So that's come up you know, or rather that's compelled organizations to evolve what is called personalized learning, which means Amit has a need for a different learning path. Uh, Sanjay should have a different learning path. Everyone should have a separate learning path. How do you do this at scale, Amit? Let's say there are a million users. So technology, which should be able to automatically build personalized learning paths for people, that's going to be critical. The other thing is today, more than $200 billion, US billion dollars, is spent every year on corporate learning. 50% of that happens virtually. If $100 billion is being spent virtually, and only 20% of the organizations are saying they're satisfied with the results, what they're really saying is, we don't see measurable ROI coming out of this entire initiative. So something is going wrong somewhere, right? So learning in the future will need to do three or four things according to me. One, it needs to be learner-centric. Two, it needs to provide great learning engagement tools. Three, it should be allowing collaborative learning, which means Amit should be able to learn from Jagmohan, Jagmohan should be able to pick up something from Sanjay, and so on and so forth. Social learning, the ability to push content towards you, which is the appropriate content for you or something that you are aligned towards, right? And something which offers measurable ROI to all these stakeholders, learners for the money they're spending and the time they're spending, organizations, you know, uh, uh, for again, the, uh, the, the investments they're making in the learning programs, all of that needs to come in to really take this forward. I think the age of the learner experience uh, is going to replace the age of a standalone learning system and that's already started happening that's great and that's great insights can i can i add a few points i mean yeah no, yeah jagmohan yeah, did, Jack did brilliantly uh, but just you know if i think uh, from university point of view uh personalized learning he said very correctly and you know collaborative that is the that is the requirement because when students go to industry they have to work in a team so they should also learn in a collaborative manner. So what is happening now in technology front is that, you know, some tools are emerging and I think these tools will become matured. But uh, for example, what some of us are doing, let's say at Ahmedabad University, we, we empower faculty with digital whiteboard, which can be connected to your laptop. And some are learn, some they learn quickly, some they struggle, but now they're doing it. So, you know, give them digital whiteboard, which has flexibility, the way you write, the way you talk, you know, it, it can be done with complete flexibility. Then there are, I will not talk about commercial uh, platforms, there are very brilliant commercial platforms, but there is an open, I mean free, it has commercial also, Miro, M-I-R-O kind of uh, tool, which is very collaborative, and some of our faculty members are using very, very extensively. And third is, you know, virtual labs. In a, such a big country, um, I, I, I personally believe that, you know, we need to scale it, scale it up a bit, you know, uh, people like you from NASCOM and big organizations can help us to do that. We need virtual labs so that these students, as Jagmohan said, very contextual, very personalized, very collaborative learning can happen. And then and then only these students will become, you know, really talented and they will be able to get, uh, you know, good opportunities in a complex industry scenario. So. Sure. So, I think while while we are talking about the platform, and I think uh, uh, Doctor Sagman, you talked about the how it becomes important for the for the platform to drive the engagement for the learner. Right? So, let's talk about the learner experience now, right? Because that's that's the most important part of it, the adoption point of view. Unless the experience is there, 
learner will not adopt it and and it happens at everywhere whether it is a university or whether it is a uh, corporate life so what what to make what do what do we do so that the learner experience improves right i mean i know the online platform kind of an, are doing kind of a great job of uh, somewhere doing collaboratively like um, Uh, oh, that's a great question. We talked about the tools also, Miro. Correct. I mean, but what else? I mean, what what we can do to make it whole as a great experience for the learners, so that it learning doesn't come by force, but more of an enjoyment. Like right now, everyone is sitting at home, trying to kind of do certain things, and and the time they can spend in the learning will be the most helpful. So, uh, that's a great question, Amit. Um, just one point before I address that question. Uh, I think I missed out on how. learning platforms can actually benefit academic institutions we yeah, spoke yeah. about gross enrollment ratios at the beginning of this yeah, discussion yeah yeah today if a university or a college has 1000 students a uh, a digital campus or a smart campus through a good virtual platform can actually enable them to take that 1000 students to 100000 students and if you look at the nep 2020 and the you know ugc uh, recommendations i think 2018 uh it's heavily focused towards learning platforms which are able to drive that along with learner engagement so i i thought i'll just mention that now to your question uh why will anybody want to learn forget a learner anybody it has to be enjoyable to start with right so the first thing is the the design of the content that you put up digitally has to be structured in such a way that it is enjoyable so gone are the days where you put up two hour long content so nano learning <clears throat> is becoming important micro learning you should be able to have content in bite sized pieces so that people can actually go through them quickly take some learnings and you know that's it so that's number one two uh as a learner if your platform can help me understand where i'm strong and where i'm facing difficulty and then is able to recommend to me how i can address that difficulty i think that becomes a very powerful pull factor amit you spoke about pull versus push if i can understand where my difficulties are and get a solution to that problem that's the second part the third part is competition and collaboration so a platform which can use gamification to foster competitive spirit which means how i am doing versus amit or versus sanjay Uh, and you know on the leaderboard i am actually showing on the top that can be a very powerful motivator the other is collaboration most people learn faster and learning sticks more when it's happening collaboratively so a platform which through gamification technologies can foster both competitive and collaborative is also going to uh, enrich the uh, 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 learner experience um the the other is automation uh and automation by automation i mean look today if you look at academic institutions uh, and i have run one uh, for about a decade uh, sanjay will bear me out hopefully on this uh if i remember at least 60% of my faculty's time was spent on administrative work which honestly is not their core competence their core competence is their domain expertise and where they can add value to students is using that core expertise but more importantly spending time with those students you know to facilitate their learning process automation can actually help you do that by taking away uh, some of the repetitive processes away and enabling faculties to spend more time with students on this so a platform which allows you to do that and allows the student to engage with faculties or in corporate sector to allow learners to engage with trainers that will also augment the learner experience so these are some of the things there's a lot more but i mean uh, i would say these are some of the ones that i would want to talk about probably at this stage uh, sanjay might want to add a few yeah no you have covered uh, most of the points jagmohan very nicely as a, as usual and uh, my only addition would be that you know we need personalized kind of learning what i see in our university and i'm sure other universities might be observing is that personalized learning is missing actually even with this existing platform and students don't find it very interesting because you know everybody has his or her own pace and style and everything so that is to be done 
still digital technologies is evolving and i'm sure uh, even after you know post covid this the way digital technology and the way impact is improving and the way you give global context i think there is a big hope you know i mean there is a big kind of you know demand likely to come out of this particular thing and if you can recall you know some of the companies have already said that you know big companies i will not name them but they will not hire students coming only from universities you know if somebody is able to certify get some some required certification that means students they have knowledge you know knowledge in certain areas companies are ready to you know uh, recruit them so that looks like a future but my only suggestion would be that you know uh, when you when you talk to industry people if they can please make those tools very personalized you know and very context oriented for example let's say students are learning data structures so instead of, instead of starting in a flat manner if you can go back to the context of each student and what each student was facing in and out if you can restore that context and here i'm sure as you know you need artificial intelligence and you know augmented reality and those kind of things i think future tools would require all those kind of capability and and, and i'm i'm sure the way uh, everything is growing i think these tools will become reality uh, in, in near future yeah okay so i think let's kind of in, uh uh Professor Sanjay, you talked about the artificial intelligence. So let's kind of and dig deep little into that. And just a time check. I think we will have just kind of maybe five seven minutes more. So let's kind of and cover this important point on how are we seeing the role of AI, machine learning in kind of and transforming the whole learning system. I mean, I think one example I can talk from my side is I mean, the coming up as a we used to call it as a cognitive tutor, right? So ai assisting learner in terms of assessing what the level of the learner is what the learning needs are and then as the course kind of and progress there is the kind of and level will keep increasing based on the the system how the system will analyze the learner is absorbing or what are the things that the learner would want to do for them like right? so i think ai can do a lot in terms of becoming a virtual tutor sitting at right in front of you so that's the kind of one example then i can say but from your experience i mean um, in in whatever in the last few years seeing this new technology coming into the learning so uh, i think it would be great to kind of and get your thoughts from both of you on how ai and machine learning is now getting used in the learning and which is making it again more interactive more collaborative more experiential Sanjay, would you want to address this first, or I, I will start and then I will hand over to you. So, uh, what what I believe is that you know the last word which you said, I mean, is very very important. Experiential learning, right? Unless students really uh, they are really involved in whichever education, engineering, arts, management, medicine. Well, medicine has the biggest is the classical example of experiential learning, and subsequently engineering also. So, if you improve your experiential learning effectively. And, and 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 believe me a bit you know your faculty has to do a lot of extensive work experiential learning is not easy what pedagogy how will you do it you know it requires a tremendous planning starting from top and their ai will be very very useful uh, when i when i say ai i assume that you know machine learning which does more of statistical kind of computing so what is happening is you know today uh, fortunately the way software industry the way technology is growing i think the limitations regarding computations data size you know on the fly kind of you know uh, recommendations which are required they can be done very easily and looking at the way industry is growing uh, i believe that you know they will exploit the power of uh, all these features and very slowly and gradually instead of ordinary as you said initially instead of very flat lms slowly and gradually we will have you know uh, learning uh, centric learner centric kind of you know systems which to be highly personalized and you know it will help a student to grow uh, based on his or her you know capability and you know ability plus it will also you know uh, it will also enable the individuals to self learn when i say self learn because you don't have to clear the course you know you have to go and work in the industry or real world to solve the problems so you should not forget those concepts but even if you are not uh, if you are not able to recall concepts how easily you can go back to this kind of you know ai based tools and refresh your knowledge so that you know you go and work in industry real world problems and solve so that is a potential i see 
So, <clears throat> yeah, Jokon, yeah. I think that was a fantastic, um, that was a fantastic observation from Sanjay. Um, my two penny on this is, look, um, uh, it's the it's the proactive approach versus the post mortem approach, right? Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you three or four applications, and I think that should explain uh, okay. yeah. my perspective on this. Assume that a course is running. Now, in most cases, after the course is over, we do a postmortem. We figure out where it went well, what didn't happen well, and then we try and replicate that or you know use those best practices. Yeah. Uh, some of these technologies can actually help you course correct in real time. So AI would help you make uh, decision making, uh, would help your decision making process. So what is going wrong here? Uh, is it content related? Is it instructor related? Is it a student profile related? Is it a mismatch of content versus you know audience? And, and many other things. Uh, so AI led decision making becomes a very powerful tool. The second piece is how do you use machine learning capabilities of the system? So one use case could be, I have 50 faculty. My machine learning algorithm would actually recommend to me that for this particular course, for these kind of student profiles, which is the ideal faculty fit and automatically the instructor recommendation happens. By the way, we're already doing this in our LMS LXP solution. Um, the third use case could be, uh, as I said, a student uh, has consumed content on impactful communication, has given it a rating of five, has also consumed content around presentation skills, and the machine learning algorithm now is able to pull content, not just from within the system, but from outside as well, and push that content to that. That's the ML use case algorithm there. Uh, and then of course, there are live analytics, uh, which are nothing but intelligent algorithms, which will help make the course much more effective. So there are multiple use cases. Um, uh, uh, another use case could be, um, if a person with this profile has joined in, this should be the right course, which should be recommended to this person, right? Uh, another could be where you have an assessment-based uh, recommendation happening. So there is an assessment happening. Based on this assessment, if this is how you did, then these are the learning paths that you should be picking up. The scope is humongous. We spent almost three years building this, this, this tech, uh, Amit, and while we have all of what I just spoke about, when I look at it, I think it will take us years to take it to a level where we can completely automate, you know, most of the essential pieces. But that's where life is headed. And uh, I don't think it is uh, because of COVID. I think the change had started happening years ago. In fact, if you look at online learning in the last five, six years, uh, online learning in India has gone up by 800%, by the way, okay? In the next three years or two and a half years, it is going to triple. So. I think it was already happening. COVID has just made us more aware of the change, right? But the change is there. And now the acceptance and adaptability will probably be higher. That's, that's it. That's the way I look at it. Great, great. Okay, so I think we just have maybe, I think two, three more minutes and um, I will just pose my last question and um, to both of you and uh, with, and I think if I appreciate if you can just get a one minute response. And um, you already touched upon it, Jakmohan. Uh, the, I wanted to talk about the online learning, the stats around online learning. So the overall education market in India is about hundred billion dollars. And as per what I learned is for the last year in India, it was for online learning, it was $2 billion, right? So 2 billion out of the overall hundred billion dollars. While we are kind of, and you talked about growing at a phenomenal rate and then COVID has really kind of made that growth to the exponential. Where do you see the, future of now the online platform, online learning going and um, uh, is that kind of, and, and then what else the corporates can do to kind of and to make sure that it's used to the best of the potential, right? So I think question to both of you, very quick answer. 
KPMG report says the total education market is $245 billion. The total edtech market next year will be $1.96 billion, so close to $2 billion. Yeah. Uh, the one word answer, one line answer to this is um, forward thinking edtech companies are going to not just focus on the traditional edtech market, they will try and use uh, uh, you know, a blue, a blue ocean strategy to try and see if they can pick out a large stake from the traditional education market. I think it's primed to go up significantly high over the next few years. Great, thank you. Dr. Sanjay? Hey, as, as university, as university, we have decided that, you know, we will continue uh, even post COVID scenario. It has helped us a lot because, you know, in university, you always have students, you know, at a different levels. So we don't look at only at those you know, top-notch students. You have to always look at average and below average learners. So these tools and the, the, the technology which is available is doing job quite nicely, which is already improving our academic delivery part. I said delivery part. And because it is able to improve our delivery part with all this personalized learning and the way we narrated in terms of you know, power of ML, AI kind of, you know, uh, the way potential is likely to realize, I think most universities will continue to use this digital technology uh, for their students and you know for their audience great thank you i think maybe i think we need to close now i mean, never felt like this almost one hour we have been talking and, and i think there was still a lot more to talk maybe i think we'll catch over some other time but uh, thank you uh, it was a great learning for me i mean talking to both of you um it was great insights so uh, thank you kind of and for joining me and i mean you did a brilliant you. job the way you connected all these points you did a brilliant job based on your profile and your background knowledge you did it brilliantly let me acknowledge you yeah thank, thank you, you so much amit i think you just brought it all together and um, the facilitation was brilliant i thoroughly enjoyed it Sanjay, thank you so much for your insights. It was great learning for me. And thank you, Gesia, again, for inviting us over. Uh, lovely event. and wish you the best. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you, Gesia team. It was a lovely event. Was, I think everyone is learning a lot today. So, and best wishes. Thank you. Thank so you so much, much sir. Time for question and answer. So uh, I think I'll I leave it to you. Thank you, sir.